Okay, uh, hi everyone. Uh, my name is Raven and welcome and thanks for coming to today's Hacker School Workshop. Uh, we'll be covering Rust. Um, I'll, I'll be sitting here because like, I mainly need to use my computer for demonstration and stuff. Um, but yeah, so this is me. I'm currently a year two studying comp science in NUS. Um, and I enjoy doing web development and also learning about programming languages. So Rust was one of them. I learned it maybe a few years ago and I have enjoyed using it for a while now. And um, so when like NUS hackers was like, hey, who wants to give a workshop for like Rust? I was like, hey, I love Rust and let me do it. Um, hopefully you all will bear with me. I think maybe there's someone better than me in the audience can give suggestions. I might get things wrong. And yeah, just, just shout out if you guys have any questions like halfway through. Uh, yeah, so let's jump right in. Uh, we're learning about the Rust programming language today. And I've shamelessly lifted some of Rust's key features that are making it useful as a programming language. So firstly is performance. Uh, Rust doesn't have a runtime or garbage collector. So you won't have any issues like, hey, why is the why is my like in Java where you're like, hey, why is my program suddenly freezing to do garbage collection? Or like um there's no overhead and everything is like really like metal programming, kind of feels like C and C. Um it also has very good support now for embedded devices. So you'll see it in a lot of like small chips around. Um, it's very reliable. Um, you'll see later that why um, it's so reliable in its type system. Um, so, so you can kind of think of it like, hey, if my code compiles, generally it will run correctly. So it's, the, it's different from like JavaScript where like you don't know, you send your, you deploy your web application and you're like, hey, um, it'll, it'll crash like maybe five hours down the road and you won't know, right? Um, there's also some memory and safety guarantees, and we'll talk about them later. And most of all, um, although a lot of people say, hey, it makes you less productive because you're always fighting the compiler, I'd argue that it makes you more productive because the compiler errors that Rust gives that you'll see later are incredibly good. And they always tell you, some of them literally tell you the answer like, oh, uh, do this instead of this. And you're like, oh, okay. And you fix and everything works and you're happy. It's not like C++ where you crash and then like the, the error message is like, 30,000 lines long. Um, it has very good tooling. You install something, it generally works. And editor support is also amazing. Um, it, good, it has good support for VS Code, Vim, Emacs, and all the standard editors that you can think about. Okay, so Rust has like the book, which is like the standard book that everyone will go through if you click like learn on the Rust website. So if you want to learn this, so you can click on the slides. Oh yeah, the slides are also uh, linked here. And also um, I've sent it in the NUS Hackers chat. Um, yeah, so most of the content today is taken from the book and it follows a similar structure. And if you want to reference it after this workshop, you can just reference the book as well. So I'm trying to summarize everything today in like a more succinct way. So uh, we don't have to like go through all the little nitty gritty things. And it's also the way that I understand Rust. So this is more of, my perspective on how I learned Rust in the beginning. And hopefully that's helpful to you. So, okay, so what will we actually cover? We'll cover uh, these things. And these are all the things, this, this is like the typical thing you'll go through when learning a new programming language. You'll learn about um, data types, integers, booleans, floats, uh, functions, all that that you learn in a typical programming language. So then ownership and memory model is something you need to Rust. We'll cover that later. Then we'll also have compo data composition, so how to build more complex data structures. And then we also have now your famous null pointer exception. How does Rust deal with that? And also error handling. How do we handle errors in Rust? And we'll cover some basic polymorphism with traits. Um, so as you can see, hopefully everyone here already knows how to code in maybe like Python. I will, I will try to cater towards people who know Python. Um, and sometimes I'll cover more in-depth topics that require maybe like C++ knowledge, but this should be just very bit of very little bit of the content I'll cover today. So Rust is an incredibly complex language. You will take a very long time to learn all of the features it has. So what we won't cover today, and I'm sorry if you wanted to learn one of these things and you can't learn it today, but uh, creates modules, I can just read. But these are all the more complex things that you'll learn after building like a strong foundation in basic Rust. Yes, correct. So that will be covered in ownership and memory model, which we'll do today. So, so I think um, later I'll cover it, but 
um, ownership and memory model are like the core features of Rust. So after today, you should be able to write a simple like command line program in Rust. Does that answer the question? Okay, so um, hopefully this is interactive. Uh, this is this aims to be an interactive workshop. So um, if you guys have the slides pulled up, we'll be using the Rust playground for convenience today. So you can just click on the link, uh, open. And this is what we're using today. So we have our Hello World program here. Um, and then when you click run, it runs and it prints Hello World. Super convenient. Um, hopefully we don't get like rate limited because everyone's using like the same IP or some shit. But uh, yeah. Uh, yeah, yeah. So uh, if, if you have Rust installed in your system, you can run it there also. But this is a very convenient way to just explain things. Okay, so um, there's a lot of stuff here, but essentially, like sometimes when I'm um displaying code, like I won't, I will skip the, I'll skip the fn main in my slides because you can just assume that most of the code that we're writing goes inside the main function here. So um, with that being said, this is the main function. This declares a function called main, and we're printing hello world. So this is our basic hello world program in Rust. Okay, so um, very simply, let's talk about variables first. So in Rust, you declare variables by using the let keyword. So in Python, you would just do x equals to five. Uh, in Rust, if you want to declare a new variable, you would use let x equals to five. Uh, so we can try that. Okay, we can try this one first. So for example, let x equals to five and x equals to six. So this will be, Pretty easy to do in Python and it will work. But you see that, hey, there's an error. We can't assign twice to immutable variable. So this is because variables by default in Rust, ironically, they are not variable. They are, they are, they are fixed and you can't change them. So what we can do is to make them mutable if we want to achieve this behavior by typing mute. So this mute stands for mutable. And now you see that everything compiles and our program runs. It says running target playground. So that's how you know it's like running. So again, if it crashes, you'll see like, uh, let's show you. Yeah, if it crashes, it says error could not compile playground. So that's how we know if our program is like successful or not. So this is a very basic example. And so the thing about variables is that Rust also has this thing called name shadowing. So if you declare y, if you let y equals to seven and you let y equals to eight, uh, you can just can try it out on your systems as well. You realize that it actually compiles. But didn't I just say you can't change like a variable once it's been declared unless you put the mute there? Well, so this actually declares two different variables. It's y like quote unquote one and y quote unquote two. So this new y replaces the previous y and that might cause some issues down the road. So it's just an Interesting thing to keep in mind. Okay, so let's try the last example. Okay, so let mute z equals to nine and then we try to change z to true. And we see that we have an error, could not compile playground, mismatch types. So Rust is a statically typed language. So once a variable has been declared to be a certain type, in this case, z is an integer. This uh, z is an integer. We can no longer change the type of the variable. So true is not an integer. So we can't say z becomes true, right? So can anyone think of a way that we can declare a variable called z and let it be true? Like, how do we avoid this, like, mismatch types issue? Hmm. Yes, uh, so um, Joshua said that you can uh, transform the type. Yes, that would be a more complex way, but 
Um, yeah. yeah, correct. So we can achieve this behavior by just doing let z equals to 9. Uh, it goes to true. So this is just playing around with variables um, and the very basics of like how we get started with Rust. Uh, okay, yeah. So let me go through the possible types in Rust. So in Python, for example, you will have things like integers, uh, floats, sets, and uh, lists, for example. So in Rust, we also have data types, and these are the different data types. So we can have unsigned integers. So this means that um, this colon thing um, that I forgot to cover earlier, it means let this be a certain type. So let z u32 equals to 9 means that let z uh, of type unsigned integer be 9. Okay, so in this case, we have let unsigned integer, the variable name unsigned integer of u32 equals to 5. So Unsigned integers, um, for those who are not sure, unsigned integers are just integers that cannot be negative. And signed integers are integers that can be negative uh, because they have a sign, negative sign. Uh, so we have different possible types of integers. And the reason we don't see like unsigned int like in Java or like, or we just see int in Python is because uh, you, you must be very explicit about how many like bits your integer has in Rust. So the default size is 32 bits. This just means that your integer stores 32 bits of data. And also 8 bits, possible 16 bits, 64 bits, 128 bits, and U size. So U size means your current computer size, computer architecture size. Um, usually, most of you guys are using regular modern laptops. That's 64 bits by default. So you can think of U size as just the same as U64 uh, in this case. So we have, yeah. Yeah, so um, you still have the same number of bits. Um, so the question is, um, you can only store half the amount of integers on either side of the sign when you use a sign integer, right? Yeah, yeah. So, um, okay, yeah. So, I guess this brings up a more important point, which is that the different sizes of integers are just like how much numbers you can store in an integer. It's not super important usually. Um, usually, I'll just use either u size or u32. But if let's say your number is too big, like you have like nine, 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 something like that, right? It's too big. You can use more bits to store more like a, a bigger number in that sense. Um, yeah. Okay, so we have integers. U32 equals to five, negative 63. We have floats. Uh, this is just first few digits of pi. We have booleans, true and false. Um, yeah, so yeah. We also have characters. So characters are actually like, um, they can store emoji. So um, it's like Unicode characters so you can store emoji you can store like more complex things instead of just like abc um of course you can also store abc actually let me make this interactive yeah so you can store things like a b character is just one character and then you have tuples which store like a pair of items so in Python, I think you also have tuples. Like let's say you return a, B, re return a comma B in Python. That's like returning a pair of A and B. So the similar effect can be achieved by using uh, this syntax. So this is a pair of U32 and I32. And then we have the unit type, which represents a unit. So usually we use this for like, M to represent something is empty in a sense. Like when a function has no return type, but we'll get to that later. Uh, we also have more data types. We have arrays and slices in Rust. So in Python, you you would have something like, uh, for example, let one, two, three, four, five, for example. Um, so this in Rust would be called an array. And the type of this would be called uh, U32, so we'll use 32-bit integers here. 
and then the size would be five. So this means an array of five integers, right? And then we have an array of five integers here. So Rust actually makes a distinction between slices and arrays. And that's uh, like this. So a slice is just a reference to an array. We'll talk about references later, but essentially there are two different concepts. An array has a fixed length, but a slice need, need not necessarily have a fixed length. Uh, we'll talk more about it later when we talk about the ownership model. So for example, this array is fixed to a size five. And this slice says that, hey, I am slicing my array um, from the first position to the third position. Similar syntax to Python. I think Python uses the colon. But then the type is slightly different. It says that this is a slice, which is the n percent um, bracket and then u32. So we also have strings. Strings are very similar. You just put double quotes and then you put whatever's inside your string. So strings also, so Rust strings already support emoji and um, Chinese characters, all, all sorts of weird characters by default because they are UTF-8 encoded. Um, so sometimes you'll face compilation errors because Rust has two different types of strings. One is a string slice and one is a own string. A big string, you can see, big string. Um, this is similar to arrays and slices. So you have arrays and slices, you have strings and string slices. Um, but for now, um, if you're facing issues, you can just do dot two string on your string. And this will generally, this will make a, a string slice into a string. Uh, at this point, does anyone have any questions? Okay, cool. So functions uh, are declared using the fn keyword, like function min. Um, you can have a function foo here that takes in one parameter, and the parameter is uh, integer, a 32-bit integer. And then it prints hello from foo. You have a function bar that takes in a boolean and returns a 32-bit integer. So how you indicate return types in Rust, because you need to indicate return types, is this arrow and then the data type. So if a function returns integer, uh, if a function returns boolean, this will be bool and so on and so forth. And you notice that in Rust we use semicolons, but for the last like expression in a function body, you don't need to add a semicolon. This means return this value. So for example, if I go here and I paste this, and I put a semicolon here. It says that they expected a return u32, but we found empty. We found nothing. So the thing is, see, and we have a very helpful um, error message here already. You can simply just remove the semicolon. And that is effectively the same thing as return 3433 3, 3 plus 343. 3. Oh, sorry. Okay. So this achieves the same effect. And generally, we like to do this because Rust is an expression-based language. So we like to generally avoid the return keyword for most purposes. Um, of course, you are not going to return more than once from a function. So you, don't, you, you need the semicolon here. If not, this won't compile either. It will just say missing semicolon. Finally, we have our main function. And this is how you call a function in Rust. It's basically like any, any other language. You just say bar, and then you pass in your parameter, which is a Boolean in this case. Um, this is also how you uh, print like variable names in uh, variables in Rust, the value of variables, which is to use the curly braces. So um, let's give you an example. Let x equals to 5, let y equals to 6. Uh, x, number is x. Number is 5. If you want to print more than 1, just use this. And it follows the order of what you put, what you pass in. Um, if you want to flip the order, you can do this, but um, this is probably going beyond the scope of today. Like, uh, second argument, first argument. Yep. 
for now, we'll just stick with the curly braces. Okay, so control flow, um, I put a lot here, but let's break it down. So as per your usual programming languages, you have the if expression. So if a very complex expression, true and false or true and true, um, just print else print. Um, if you want to do an else if, you just do else if true and then else. Very normal. So we have, uh, in Rust, we have a match statement, which is kind of analogous to your switch statement in Java. Um, this is one of the one of the cooler parts about Rust. Um, we'll cover more in depth later, but we're saying that match, whatever this is, uh, let me indent this properly, sorry. Okay, so we have three different cases here. We say that if this expression, uh, maybe match foo is three, we'll do it's three. If it's five, then this arrow thing will do its five. Otherwise, this is everything else. This means everything else. We do it's none of the above numbers. And if we do let foo equals to three, we'll see that this prints its three. So you can add more cases by doing this arrow and then body and then print ln it's eight. And that's how you add a new case. So this is the match expression in Rust. So notice that I've been using the word expression a lot. This is because everything in nearly everything in Rust is an expression, which means that it returns a value. So this is one of the cool features that I always miss when I'm not in Rust, which is basically if statements can return values. So you have this let result equals to whatever the result of this is. So if true and true, uh, okay, if some condition, return 34, otherwise return 438. And notice that we do not have a semicolon in these things because we are returning the value. Um, similar to what I talked about earlier about not having semicolons. So you can do the same with match. So actually we can do something like match foo and then this one just put like three uh three four six nine ten and then we do let bar equals to match and this one you need a semicolon and then uh Oh, right, sorry, you need commas. <laughs> right. So a brief interview about what the exclamation mark is. Um, exclamation mark means this is not a function call, this is a macro call. And macros are things that uh, are slightly more complex things that are done at the compilation stage. Um, for now, we can you won't really touch macros until you get more advanced parts of Rust. So we can just say print ln requires an exclamation mark. So this isn't like, uh, oh no, there's a possible error or anything. It just means that this is a macro call. Uh, so yeah, so it returns four. Cool. So that's control flow. We have our loops. So a for loop in Rust, does not have um for those of you who have are familiar with the for int i equals style of for loops, uh, Rust doesn't have that. The only kind of loops that Rust has is for in. So we have for x in zero to ten. Print x. So this is the only kind of for loop that exists in Rust, if I'm not mistaken. Okay, so we just print uh, 0 to 9. If you want to print 10, just put equal sign. And then we print 10 as well. Uh, we have while loops, which we can do let mute i equals to 0, while i is less than 10. Print ln i. 
uh, then i plus equals to one. There is no plus plus in Rust either, so you will not have i plus plus. Just put i plus equals to one. And yeah, you'll have your standard for loop with this. So while loops work very similar way, for loops, there's only the for in, and what you can in exactly in a for loop, um, I'll talk about briefly later, but um, generally you can use, for, for simple numbers, you can use zero dot dot something, or you can use five dot dot 20, 23 or something. And if you want to reverse this, you can just say reverse. Cool. So that's control flow. And at this point, does anyone have any questions? I see. So uh, in the follow-up, this is implicitly declared. So you can imagine it just having a uh, uh, let x equals to current value here. It's the same thing. So it's declared, and x only exists within the scope of the follow-up. You can't use x here. Unfuse. Okay. Cool. So that um does that answer your question? Yeah. Okay. Uh so we have this. And now let's do a quick exercise, which is to encode this beer song thing um into Rust. To to write it out in Rust. Um I'll just put like five minutes to it. Um if you don't want to type this out, you can just get the slides and uh, copy paste from the slides. And yeah, so notice that this is um the, the challenge, the slight challenge comes when you're writing one bottle, which has no S, and then no more bottles at the end, and then this says something completely different. It doesn't say take it down. Yeah, I'll just give five minutes, and then we will go through the solution and then move on. Uh, but okay, it's been about three to four minutes. Uh, yeah. Has everyone like, I mean, even if you haven't finished it because it's just copy pasting a lot of text, like everyone, anyone does not get the gist of it yet. Okay, cool. Um, just go through the solution quickly. It's not super complicated. So um, I did this earlier because that's what we'll use for this exercise. We're just going to go from zero to 99 in reverse, 99 equals in reverse. And uh, I'm going to cheat. I'm going to copy paste the solution, but. Uh, shit. But we basically have the solution here, which is. I declared a function called verse, and that function basically prints out the current line. And it says that uh, we match against n, which is the current uh, integer, the current, like, uh, it current index, and then if it's zero, we print no more bottles. If it's one, we print one more bottle. If we if it's two, we print two bottles. And if it's n, we print, uh, well, n, and n minus one. So very simple use of the match statement, very simple use of function calls, and very simple use of a for loop. Uh, anyone has any questions? Okay, cool. Uh, we'll move on. And now we come to the gist of today's um, workshop. So just now was like a brief introduction, um, get you guys started and actually writing code. Uh, now hopefully we talk about, um, hopefully this, if anything, if there's anything to take away from this workshop, it will be understanding of ownership and memory model. So please ask questions if things are not clear. This is the part that I had the most difficulty with learning Rust and most people. So Rust handles memory management in a unique way, right? So there's no need for a garbage collector, but there's no need for manually freeing of memory either. So everything is handled seemingly automatically. So how this is done in um, Python and in Java is that if you have, let's say, you do like x equals to uh, some object, and then um, somewhere later, the compa uh, Python realizes you don't need X. So there's actually a program running as you run Python in the background called the garbage collector saying, hey, if you don't need, if you're not going to use X anymore, that means we don't see, maybe you do X dot A, X dot B. But if we don't see anything here anymore, Python says, hey, we don't need X anymore. And then we clear the memory so that we can use it for other things. 
So that's garbage collection. Rust doesn't do this. It doesn't have a secret program running in the background and telling you, hey, um, doesn't checking everything that you write. But it also, you also don't need to manually say, I don't need this memory anymore. I don't need this. How is that possible? Um, they've developed a very unique way called the ownership and memory model. And it has vast implications on how you like write Rust across the board. So if there's one thing to take away, it will be this. So let's see an example. Very innocent. Let's copy paste this. So we have let S1 equals to hello. <coughs> hello. Um, so this is a big letter string. This is also a string. And we click run. Right, so it says hello, it says S2 is S1, and then print S1. Or we can print S2 as well. An error. What? Isn't this completely normal? What's going on here? So, yeah, see, it says move occurs because S1 has type string, which does not implement copy trait. Okay, maybe this is a bit ambiguous. And it says borrow of move value S1. So it seems like it's saying here value borrowed after move. So it's, it seems like S1 is moved and we're trying to borrow it. So what's going on here? So let me just bring up a distinction between values and variables, right? So we see let S1 equals hello, um, in hello dot two string, hello. And we see that variable S1 owns the value hello, right? So the value here that we're talking about, the value is just the string hello. It's not S1, it's not S2, it's just hello. And S1, being the variable, owns the value hello. So when we say let S1 equals to hello, we're saying that, okay, S1 now owns the value hello. And when we do let S2 equals to S1, we're saying we're not really assigning S1 to S2. We are moving the value of S1 into S2. The thing is, now that the value has moved, what is S1? It has no longer any value, right? Oh, that sounds bad. Okay, it has no longer any value. And now when print LN wants to use the value of S1, because obviously you need hello in order to print hello, right? You can't because it has been moved into S2. So this is the idea of ownership, variables, own values. Uh, oh, okay. So um, I meant this. I meant to cover this one slide earlier, but um, there are two classes of bugs in traditional systems programming, like C and C plus plus, that we're trying to solve here. So there's memory management use after free and double free, and then uh, I don't know what this is called, but I just call it unknowing mutation. Uh, let me just do quick demos. So this is not really like required, but uh, I will show you guys examples of this. So for example, um, C. I have to use C++ here because that's the probably the easiest way to demonstrate this. But uh, for those of you who understand C++, imagine you have, um, sorry, we go use after free first. So imagine you have a main function and then you declare an array of eight integers and then you set the first integer array to five. And then you print the first item of the array. Sure, it works, right? But then you free the array. So this could be called maybe something else, something innocent, innocent function. Right, which frees the array. And what happens if you call print first item again? So for those of you who have tried anything to do with C++ before, I think this will end up in a sec fault. Correct me if I'm wrong, but it will be a sec fault or... Okay, maybe it's not a sec fault. Just call use after free. Right. So this is you trying to use the, the, the value of array after it has been freed. So Rust prevents this by using the ownership model. Uh, also, we have the main function, and then we declare x equals to 5, and then full uses, uh, full prints out the value of x is 5, and then we call bar, and then we call full again. We expect 5 here, right? But the thing is, it will print out 23, because in bar, we've changed the value of 23. Oops, this could be like a thousand line code base, and you never spotted this, and it could cause a big error in production, right? So... Just a brief interlude. These are the two classes of bugs that we're trying to prevent using the ownership model. Okay. So again, let's reiterate, go back to what we talked about earlier. Each value in Rust has an owner and the owner is usually a variable. So S1 owned the value hello. 
there can only be one owner of a value at a time. And when the owner goes out of scope, the value will be dropped. So with these three simple rules, we've established the entire ownership model of Rust. So what does it mean to go out of scope, right? Well, you see, usually in if statements, in uh, for loops and all that, we have scopes, which are usually these curly braces thing. And uh, this. So we will usually have let s equals to some string, and then we'll do some stuff with s, right? We'll print it out, we'll, we'll increase the size, we'll add to it. And then after the curly brace, we can no longer add s down here. That is as per usual normal programming. So the thing is, at this curly brace, we end the scope, right? We close the, the scope that s is in. And in Rust, what, that's, what this means is that since s is the owner of some string slice, we will drop some string slice. We will free it. It is gone. We are not using the memory anymore. And we can use that memory for other things. So um, for those who understand C++, this is analogous to like just freeing, calling free on the thing, uh, if it's a pointer. Okay. So are all values moved? This seems a bit extraneous, right? I use S1, I do S2, and then suddenly I can't use S1 anymore. So this is a general rule. It's not 100% accurate, but most of the types that start with lowercase letters, your primitive types, your integers, your booleans, they implement copy. So instead of moving them, you copy them. And that was the, if we go back up to the error message here, uh, see, remember it says, we just not implement the copy trait. So integers and booleans, all that, they implement the copy trait. And that's why they can be copied. Okay, so you can do this. This will compile because integers are copied. So to contrast, I'll just leave this example here. And this will compile and run. Because here we're not moving the value of n1 to n2. We are copying the value of n1 into n2. So again, to reiterate all the rules that we talked about earlier, there is no assignment. There's no like uh, A equals to B. We're not talking about that. We're talking about either moving or copying. Uh, so now we talk about function calls. So how does moving work in relation to function calls? Well, if you interpret this example here, we have let bar equals to append, and then we have full bar, right? Full calling the function, calling the function full passing in bar. So if you try to run this, uh, and if I didn't screw up, this is a compile error. There we go, yeah. Similar borrow of move value bar, and the thing is, and again, you can see how useful the Rust compiler is. This is amazing. It says value moved here, right? So now value borrowed here after move. Bar has been moved into the full function and we can no longer use it afterwards. Remember the example earlier where like we passed that parameter in and suddenly we can't use it anymore, it crashes. So well, this is the perfect example of how Rust solves that by simply not allowing you to run the code at all. You just can't run this, right? So now this will run. Uh, I mean, if I comment this out, this will run and we will still print, I have a pen, right? So now how do you do this, right? I can't just like be passing stuff into functions and then I can't use them anymore. Seems a bit extra. So we can move back outwards by using return values. So for example, very similar to the example earlier, we say let bar equals to append, we call the function and we move bar into the function. So we move the value append into the function and then we move it back out by returning it. See, so now that we return it, we can assign a, uh, assign a variable back to it and then we can print it and this should compile. Yes. Yes, correct. Um, that's a good question. So, um, the question is, if I'm getting you correctly, is that, is it better to copy, like, instead of moving into the function and then having to move it back out, is it better to copy into the function? Like, what if we just straight up copy the string? What if we just do 
let bar equals to append and let bez equals to append, right? Or like copy in other ways. Though. Well, the answer is it depends and it depends on what you want to achieve. So copying can be slow. Um, if you copy a string, hello. If you copy a string, you have to go through the entire string and copy each character one by one. And if your string is one gigabyte long, well, you're going to copy one entire gigabyte. So moving does not have a cost. It is purely like compiler semantics. So when you move something, you, you don't actually copy it. You actually literally just use the same value, but with a different variable name. So to answer your question, it depends on whether copying is okay. And maybe copying is better and simpler to understand instead of moving stuff all over the place. So yeah, so so I keep talking about how I'm annoyed about having to move stuff all over the place, and that's very true. And I guess the Rust developers were also quite annoyed at that. So they developed this idea called borrowing. So if you own something, I just want to borrow it for a while to use it. I don't actually have, you don't have to pass the whole thing to me. You can just borrow it for a while. And that's where the, I guess the idea of borrowing comes from. And so we have a very similar example here, except that now we're using borrowing and references. So here we borrow the value of bar instead of moving out of it. And a reference to the value. So imagine like bar still holds, still owns the value. We are not actually moving out of bar, but I'm borrowing a reference to it. I'm just referring to it. And I'm using it to print, right? So this end string means that and is just a reference to a string. And means a reference to. So and string is a reference to a string. And then I print that. And now I still can have my pen because I haven't moved out of bar. So let's try this code. Yeah, and now it works. So again, if we delete this, we move, we do this, it doesn't work. So this is the difference between referencing, borrowing, sorry, and owning uh, and moving a value. Uh, yeah, we're getting to that in the next few slides. Yeah. So the question was, uh, can we now modify the string? And yeah, we can. We'll get to it in the next few slides. Okay, we're getting into it in the next slide. Uh, <laughs> okay, so um, we'll start simple. We'll go back to ownership. Ignore borrowing for now. Okay, so we're going to talk about mutation or like changing of own values. So string has this very convenient function for me to demo. Uh, thanks, string. But um, you can just push string and then it will just mute, like modify the string. Right, so hello and you push string, comma world and you'll print hello world. Uh, remember that we have Everything in Rust is immutable by default. You can't modify it. So we have to add the mute keyword to make it uh, mutable. Okay, how do we mutate borrowed values, right? So we have this example, let foo equals to string, hello. And bar is now borrowing the string. So we have borrowing of foo. And then string. Compile error, right? Now what, what now what do we do? Um so maybe I'll give 30 seconds for you all to try it out. Just copy paste this, try it out in your editor, and maybe someone can tell me the answer. Do we need a mute here? Do we need a mute here? Just shout out the answer if anyone has one. Okay, so um, I'll just go to the next slide, which has the answer. Uh, okay, wait, no, it does not. Uh, I will attempt to fix it live because I forgot to include the solution. Uh, hope this works. 
Okay, so let's try. Um, we have the suggestions, right? So let's try. Well, make this mutable first. And now we can try to debug this. Cannot borrow bar as mutable. It is behind a end reference. So what does Rust suggest? Oh, okay, let's just follow it. Uh, end mute. Oh, okay, we still have an error. It is behind a mute re uh, end reference. Oh, it says add a mute here. Okay. Hey, it works. Uh, well, so I guess we just follow the compiler. Uh, for those of you who follow a compiler, congratulations. But essentially, we have to add a whole lot of mute. And this is by design because Rust wants to eliminate all those errors where you accidentally change a variable when you don't want to. Okay, so let me just like, um, I think, okay, wait, sorry. So firstly, foo, the original owner of the value, has to make, you have to make it mutable. Uh, if you don't make it mutable, it doesn't work. So yeah, so if you yourself, the owner, don't want, doesn't want to change the value, then obviously, if you lend your stuff to people, you won't want them to change it either. So you must declare this as mutable. And then you need to borrow it using a mutable borrow. I'm telling the owner, hey, I'm going to borrow this and I'm going to change it. Right? So I need to declare that. This is just, hey, I'm borrowing it. This means, hey, I'm borrowing it and I'm probably going to change it. Right? And then the reference type changes accordingly. It's now no longer a reference to a string. It's a mutable reference to a string. And finally, everything works. So we have more rules. There's a lot of rules, but it's to keep yourself in check. Right. So rules of mutation and borrowing. You can either have multiple immutable borrows or one mutable borrow. So let's try this out. So this is an example of things that surprised me when I was writing these slides, right? Because I just said, you can only have one immutable, you can only have one mutable borrow or multiple immutable borrows, but somehow this compiles. I was like, what? What's going on here? Right, because I'm taking, a, I'm borrowing it immutably, I'm borrowing it immutably, and then I'm borrowing immutably. But it's either or, doesn't work. So it turns out that if you try to use any of this below, then it gives the compile error. I didn't change anything here. Just gives me an error now. So why? Well, because... Oh, okay. Uh, because it turns out Rust compiler detected that, hey, you're not actually using the values. So it inserted a drop foo here, it inserted drop bar here uh, when this doesn't exist. So drop is just a function to drop it manually instead of like dropping when it goes out of scope, like I talked about earlier. And it says, okay, so this means that there is no longer foo and bar, and now this mutable borrow works. But the thing is when we declared print ln foo, we can no longer drop foo here, right? Because we need foo below. So this was deleted. The compiler didn't insert this for us. Compiler didn't insert this for us. And now it's a compile error because you have two mutable borrows. And then now you're trying to borrow it mutably again. And it breaks the rules. So why do we have this rule of like one mutable borrow or like multiple immutable borrows? So let's say um, we have foo. And then let's say this is allowed, right? So if I print foo, ignore this, delete this. Okay. So let's say I have foo and I have bears, right? So I print foo, I print bears. And since bears is mutable, I can do bears.push string. Uh, whoa. Right? This is valid because you can mutate stuff because this is mutable and this is mutable. Right? But now what happens if I print foo again? So imagine you borrow something from someone. You look at it. You look away for a while. And then you look at it again and the value changes. Like that is a source of many, many bugs in many, many modern programs today. 
So these rules were introduced saying that, hey, if I'm, if I'm currently borrowing from you and I don't expect it to change, right? Because I don't have mute there. I don't expect it to change. Don't change it from under me. So that's why you cannot have uh, multiple immutable borrow. You cannot have multiple mutable borrows. You can't do this twice. Oh, oh shit. Twice. Yeah. Um, so this is best learned through experience. So let's try another exercise. Uh, whoa, okay. Let's try another exercise. So just copy paste this entire thing into the editor and then fix it. Yeah. So I'll give this about five minutes. Uh, actually, okay. So it's also break time. So I'll give this 10 minutes and then y'all can take the refreshments as well and then go toilet or whatever. And then we'll come back and we'll continue the workshop. Okay, uh, it's been 10 minutes. How is everyone in the exercise? Have, have anyone finished it? Like, like fully compiled, Rust compiled. Ooh, okay, nice. Um, for those who managed to get it, congratulations. Uh, I'll just solve it live um, for the sake of the... Oh, okay, I gave myself a solution here. Uh, never mind, solve it live anyway. Okay, so uh, we run this and it obviously gives a lot of errors. It says that um, borrow of move value data. So you see in display to user, we are trying to move it, but um, this goes back to our very first example. After you move into data, we can no longer use it anywhere afterwards. So let's change this. So you realize that data display to user is just like printing out data. It doesn't actually have to take ownership of data. So we can convert this to a reference to a string instead of a whole string. And then correspondingly, we want to borrow data instead of um, moving data. So that will fix the first error, hopefully. Okay, yeah, so now our error goes to string here, which is the add here function. And that's because push string, remember push string modifies the string. So we need a mutable reference to string and not just a string. So we don't want a reference to a string. We want a mutable reference to a string. And if you run this, it won't work because we need to borrow it mutably as well. We need to tell data that, hey, I'm going to take this and I'm going to change it. So we add a cheer. This works now. And finally, this is a bit more complicated, but, oh, oh, sorry. We need to make this mutable as well. Okay. So this is a little bit more complicated because you see that we are simply trying to take a reference to this and then we're trying to return it, but it says temporary value created here. So this is a confusing one. We've never faced this before. Cannot return reference to temporary value, but essentially to uppercase is a function that wants ownership of um of data we don't just like we want to we want to take in data and we're going to change it completely and then we're going to return it back to the back to the upper scope right so going back to our very like second or third example we are going to take in ownership of a string and return ownership of a string and return to uppercase and then here we are not borrowing it anymore we're going to move out of data so the terminology that people usually use is move out of data into upper uh, into convert to uppercase, do our uppercase conversion, return the string, and then assign it to uppercase data. Remember that if we want the code to look cleaner or, or if this looks cleaner to you, you can also just call this data. This works too because Rust, you can override, you can shadow variables, data, data. But um, for the sake of, um, like clarity, we'll just keep it as uppercase data and then final form. Oh, oops. Hopefully, this works. And yay, Rust is great, and so are you. And it's in uppercase. Um, anyone has any questions? Please just shoot. Uh, just now, I realized some of you didn't have the slides, so that was quite terrible. But uh, yeah, any questions? Okay, uh, we'll move on. So again, everything that we covered before the break, and this is 
on purpose. Those are the main takeaways you want from this workshop, right? You want to understand the ownership model because that is the biggest thing to learn and also the biggest thing that will usually cause you compile errors later on. So now we'll go through more like programming language stuff. So how do we compose data, right? So we've been playing around with integers, we've been playing around with uh, Boolean strings, whatever. All those are very basic. How do we, for example, get like a person or an animal? How do we represent more complex stuff in Rust? Well, we have different things. We have structs, enums. Um, this we'll talk about later. We have two commonly used types. And then we have traits and polymorphism. Okay, we'll go slow, we'll go one by one. But, uh, so notice that there's no class here, right? If you're used to Java or Python, because Rust doesn't really think of it itself as an object-oriented programming, uh, object-oriented programming language. Um, so we focus more on just very basic constructs, structs, and enums. So grouping data with structs. Here, we are declaring a struct called rectangle, and a rectangle has a width, which is a 32-bit integer, and a height, which is a 32-bit integer. Um, syntax is syntax, you use commas, you use colon here. We're saying that width is similar to how we do like let width colon u32. Here, we're just doing width u32 and height. So then in our main function, we are going to create a new variable called rectangle, and then we're going to create the struct called width and height 150. So we'll give it the values 150. So if I were to do this twice, I could do like let rect2 equals to rectangle. Uh, and obviously, if I do something like this, it will crash because height is a 32-bit integer and it's not a float. So it says found floating point. Or if I try to give it a string, it doesn't work either. So um, to make this even clearer, this is now of type rectangle. It is not of U32, it's not of I32, it's of type rectangle. Re rectangle? Rectangle, yes. Oops. Uh, yeah. And now, okay, if we try to print this, we'll print out width and height, and it should work. Width 100, height 150. Uh, let's try to print out the whole rectangle, right? Why, why, why bother to type so much? Oh no, crash. So the thing is, rectangle uh, is not easily, it's not displayable right now. We can't display it. Um, this is something to do with traits and more complex stuff, but um, this is more practical usage. You just do colon exclamation mark, which stands for debug print. And then you do hashtag derive debug. So this is practical stuff. Um, the understanding of it doesn't, no need to understand it too early on, but now it will just print rectangle with height. So just put this and do this and you'll print out the whole thing. Um, but it's mainly out of scope. So we'll just leave it as width and height. Whoops. Cool. So that's structs. Okay, again, how does our ownership model tie in with structs, right? Because, okay, this is, okay, this is a bad title. This is more about mutability, but how does everything we've learned earlier tie into structs? Well, you can see that now we have a reference to a mutable, a mutable reference to a rectangle. And because of that, we can do rectangle.width plus 50, right? And similar to what we had just now, we want to declare this as mutable so that the owner knows that it's going to change somewhere along the lines, the owner being rectangle, and now the function will can, can modify it accordingly. And then we borrow it as a mutable borrow as well. Okay, so this is slightly more longer. Oh, this, this. Okay, so um, in Rust, we would do... Sorry, the PDF is like messing with the indentation. Okay, yeah. So now we have, how do we declare methods? How we do rectangle dot something, right? Declare methods. Well, we can do implement rectangle, 
So this is separate from whatever we had earlier. So we still have to declare struct rectangle. And maybe this is a bit different from how we're used to uh, declaring methods. But we have struct rectangle and then we implement rectangle and then we do new, right? So this new by default is called an associated function. This is very similar to your static methods in Java or it's very similar to methods in Python where you're not, where you don't have like the self thing or self, sorry. Okay. So how do we use new? Well, we just go down here. You can see here. And we do rectangle, colon, colon, new. So this is calling an associated function. New, the function is associated with rectangle. So we call it with rectangle, colon, colon, new. And this creates us a rectangle with the corresponding width and height and returns a rectangle. And now we have a rectangle. So the thing is, how do we declare methods now? So methods are stuff that you call on objects, right? So, well, the first parameter now, we will declare as self. And you can see that self is highlighted because it's a special parameter. It's saying the rectangle itself, right? So self.width, self.height is the current rectangles, the receiver's width and height. So now this is much more familiar to us. We can do rectangle.area, which calls area. And this self is automatically rectangle. So self is rectangle. And then we just do self the width, self the height, and then we print out area. We return a U32. So we run this, we see area is 5,000, right? So the thing is, again, notice the end here. So when we call area on rectangle, we're saying that using a reference to rectangle, an immutable reference to rectangle, perform whatever's in this method. What if we're going to change self, right? Well, if we want to change self, we have to use mutable because we want to in, we need to indicate to the compiler that, hey, I'm going to change whatever it is. Self is just another variable, another parameter. So now I can do self.width plus equals to 50. And now expand width will actually change rectangle. So what if I don't do mute here? What if the owner doesn't declare mutable? Well, now you can't change it anymore because you can't borrow rectangle as mutable if the owner didn't declare it as mutable. So let me just put it back. Run. Yeah. So that's most mostly what you'll be using in day-to-day -day coding. But um, important thing to note is that, well, I call these methods. I call this associated function. Well, actually, everything is just associated functions. And this syntax of calling dot on a struct is basically syntactic sugar for calling it like this. So this is the same thing as above. So we have rectangle.area and rectangle, quote unquote, area and rectangle. And you notice that the first parameter of area is actually self. So this becomes self. So these two are exactly the same. So you don't need to put n here because uh, Rust implicitly, so this is one of like the implicit stuff about Rust. You can, it will automatically take a reference instead of taking a, instead of moving rectangle. So uh, to illustrate my point, what if I delete n here? So if I do that, you'll notice that now I can no longer, let me get this out. So I'm going to declare a new rectangle, calculate the area and then expand width. Oh, I'm no longer taking a reference to self. I'm taking ownership. There's no reference. It's an ownership of rectangle. So now I can no longer use it afterwards. So ultimately the point here is that the self, there's reference to self and there's a mutable reference to self. So those are methods on structs. And now we go to the next way of composing data, which is enums. So it's a different way from structs. And uh, the easiest way I could think of to illustrate this is colors. So you have colors and a color can be red, green, blue, and yellow. That's all, simple. So you declare by color, colon, colon, red, color, colon, colon, green, blue, and yellow, and the variables accordingly. So this is the very basic 
form of enums. You might see this in other languages like Java. Uh, this is how you declare it. So by convention, we also put uh, use capital letters for enums. We use Pascal title case. Um, and yeah. So when code gets more like complex and less readable, we know that something is an enum if we see colon, colon, and then a capital letter. Enums can store data. So this is one of very cool things and defining things about Rust as well, is that your enums are actually, uh, can actually store data within them and each variant. So these are called variants of an enum. Variants. Each variant can store a different kind of data. So for example, I declare an enum message. I declare enum message. And there are four possible messages here. Okay, there's move, where I move to an X and Y coordinate on the screen. There's write, where I write a string message. There's change color, where I change it to a new RGB value. And there's quit, which doesn't store any data. It's just quit, right? So let me just write this down. Build. Sure, that works. So how do we use enums? Well, we use them in, I guess, in, in methods nearly the, exactly the same way as structs, right? We just use message of type message. Message could be a struct, message could be an enum. We use them in a very similar way. So now let's create a few different messages. So earlier when we had color, we would do something like red, color red. But now that our enums store data, we create them with the data inside them. So we have move up, which is a message, colon, colon, move. And because we used braces here, we will use braces here. And then we do X and Y. So you notice that braces means that your, the properties of the enum, the properties that the enum are storing will be named, in this case, X and Y. And if you use normal parentheses, there's no name, it's just the string itself. So this is not called X or whatever, this is just called string. So you have message write, and I call upon you a uh, string. We have change color with three values, similar to here. And then we have quit, which is very similar to our color red just now. Color red, which is just no nothing stored inside. And again, to use enums is nearly the same way as struct. You just, you just do this. Cool. So now you might try, okay, well, uh, for move, I want to do something like plus equals three. It says no few X on type message. Why is that? Well, because we only have X on move. We don't have X on write. We don't have X on change color. We don't have X on quit. So how does the compiler, how would the compiler know what we are like, what we want, right? X is doesn't it doesn't know what it refers to it just says no field well so this is the subtle differences if this were a struct with x i32 and y i32 this would work right but now that we are using variants to store data instead of structs we need to do something a bit more complex hmm. so this brings us to getting data out of an enum. So let's write the send message function. So there are two ways to get out data from um, your enum. The first is your if let. So if let message move, uh, wait. if let message write, sorry. And then this will be uh, the string equals to message. Then we print ln the string. So the point here is that message could be move, write, change color, and quit. We don't know what, right? So when we don't know whether it could possibly be something, we use an if statement. And we this is a special kind of if statement called if let. And then message write equals the message. So what we're doing here, the term we would use is we are pattern, we are pattern matching on, we're matching on message to say that if it's a write kind of message, if it's the right message, then we want to take the data out, which is called the string, which is the string, and then we print it. 
So you'll see that now, because we only have one right here, it'll print it out only once. If you try it twice, I just copy pasted that, it'll just do it twice. And it doesn't do it for any of the other three. Sure, so like, um, now I guess we can do this, we can do quit, and we can proceed on apply, right? Sure, but that might get very complicated very fast. It'll get very unreadable. So for that, for more complex things, we have the match expression. So remember how the match expression just now felt a little bit useless? It was just like, oh, uh, yeah, it's if it's 3, print 3, if it's 5, print 5. Well, now we can actually use the match expression to get data out of our enum. For example, match message. So we match against all the possibilities of message. If it's a move with x, y, well, we just print x, y. If it's a write, we print message written. If it's change color, we print color changed. And I could do some underscore just means ignore. I could do like R, G, B, then do G, B, E, and this will work too. And then quit will just be print L and bye bye. If we run this, you can see that for each of those messages, it runs through all the possible cases of this match. And it says, once it matches the correct one, it runs the code that you pass to it. Yeah. So enums can also have methods. And we do it the same way as struct. We have info message, implement message. So the thing with methods is that you're declaring it on the enum itself, you're implementing message. So we can do this, everything that we did earlier. Okay. And do everything that we did earlier. Let's get rid of this. And now we can just do message.send. Sorry, move up dot send. Oops. Without a parameter, very similar to how we did with structs just now. Oh uh, yes, question. A uh, class, sorry. Uh, like you mean class, is it? Oh, okay. So, um. So, so in normal, in usual programming language, so we don't have classes in Rust. We have, uh, so class, we don't have classes. Instead, we have structs or enums. So no class. So that's, that's the high level concept, right? So usually in other programming languages, you'll see something like this, right? So you declare your possible data, the properties of the data, and then you declare your methods below. So in Rust, it's just they change the syntax. You just implement your methods in a separate block from the original data. So you declare your data here and you declare your behavior in a separate block. So this uh, has nothing to do with, um, this doesn't declare like a new struct or class or anything. It just says, okay, I'm going to implement message now. Yeah. So you can shift this like down here. It will still implement message. So it's just a way of separating your properties from your methods. Correct. So the syntax for the implement blocks are exactly the same for structs and enums. Yeah. So if this were a struct, it would still be implement message. Yeah. So now we call it just like we did for structs. Position moved to x, y, negative 32. And then, uh, yeah. It works. So we go into a brief foray into this idea of called generics. Um, this is to help me illustrate later on points. But you know how like, like when I say array in Java, I wouldn't just say, okay, here's an array, right? I would say here's an array of integers or here's an array of string. Well, um, that's the thing with statically typed programming languages. You need to you need to specify what type your array contains. So Okay, this doesn't compile, it's just an example, but how we say like array of something in Rust would be to use these angle brackets, very similar to Java if you know them. All right, so this is an array of T, and then we can declare some stuff inside, and how we would use them is an array of ints would be 
array u32, an array of strings will be array string, and array of array of ints will be array array like this. So it's just the syntax is just the angle brackets. Okay, so now we move on to another very important concept and something that we solve with Rust, which is the null pointer exception. All right. If you're using Java or you're familiar with um, Python, you will always face, oh my God, this is a none, or hey, there's a null pointer exception. Your whole pro program crashes for no reason. So you would have to try to check, okay, can this be null? Can this be null? And it might be very uh, annoying and complicated and error prone. Well, so in Rust, we have the option enum. So we don't have null at all. There's no such thing as, okay, this is null in Rust. Instead, we have, we explicitly say that this could be null. So we either have, so this is an enum, we say we either have something or we have none at all. So that's, that's the way I understand it. Okay, so using enum, so let's say we have an error, we want to store an error struct, we want to store which line it's on and maybe we want to store a message. There could be no message or there could be some message. So usually maybe in Java, you would do something like uh, class error and then maybe this is like line and then you would say string. Okay, this is a fictional programming language, right? And then you say error message now line 32. Well, this is error prone, right? Because now when I do, I have to do if error dot message equals to now. But if I'm just seeing this code as a programmer, like if I'm just seeing this code, sorry, I can't tell, right? Like I don't know whether string can be now or string cannot be now. And I have to check it manually. So now Rust makes us do this thing where we have to make it optional. So we say, we explicitly say that message is maybe a string. It's optionally a string. And when we create it accordingly, we have to specify very explicitly whether it's a string or not. So for example, if we have let compile error with message, uh, would be error and then message sum, you forgot your semicolon and then line 32. So again, 32 is just an integer. It doesn't need to have some, but then here we do some 32. And if we have no message, we do none. So we don't specify a string because there is no string. It's just none. So what happens if we try to specify, let's say some five to four? Well, it's a compile error because we specify that, hey, this is an optional string. It is not an optional integer. It is not an optional Boolean, it's an optional string. If you want an optional integer, we do u32, right? So that's how options work. Yeah, see this sum five to four gives a compile error. Okay, so that's optionals. Um, we will use them maybe later, but um, that's in general. So how about errors? In Java, you would do throw new exception or in Python, you would do raise exception, right? Well, so you notice that sometimes you call a function, you don't know that it's going to crash and suddenly it just crashes for some unbeknownst reason. Well, in Rust, we make it explicit whether a function has an error or not. So some functions will not error. For example, uh, square, right? Square will probably never have an error. If it has an error, you're probably in deep, more deeper trouble, but yeah. But what about like load content from file? Right, for example, path string. Well, you would want some way of indicating, well, sure, it's a string maybe. But like, how do I tell the person who's gonna call this function that, hey, this function might crash? Let's say the file doesn't exist, right? Well, Rust has the result type for that. So this could be a very well option string, but um, where if there's no file, then it just returns none, right? None, for example. But let's say we wanna specify more specifically what the error is. We wanna specify the error message. Well, we have the result type for that. And then here we can specify this is a file error, for example. And now we have a very good way of saying that, hey, this function will crash or might crash somewhere along the lines. So handle that explicitly in your, in wherever you call it from. Uh, this is the example. So result is either okay or error. And now you see that there are two possible uh, type parameters we have if it's okay, it will be something. If it's error, it will be something else. So in this case, we have, if it's okay, if the file loads correctly, we have a string. Otherwise, we have a file error. 
So um, I'm using it here as a very simple example. Uh, we want a function that divides an integer by five. Again, I apologize for the indentation. It's weird. But if, if it's okay, if there's an answer, it can divide by five, return the answer. Otherwise, it's an error, and then we just return the remainder. Okay, so we have if n is divisible by five, well, return okay, and then return the answer. Otherwise, return the remainder. So this could very well be a string. Okay, let's run this first. Failure, yeah. So because we try to divide 32 by five, this could very well be a string. And this could be, oh no, division fail. Right? And now if we do this, the remainder is, oh no, the division failed. So you can see that not only do we have explicit errors, we also have explicitly what the error will be. Will it be an integer? Will it be a string? Will it be a file error? It's very explicit on what we're trying to do. And again, result, as I mentioned earlier, is simply just an enum. And how do we get data out of an enum? We match it. So we match result, result divided by 32, okay, or error. And then we print accordingly. So we have a way of specifying the, so option specifies the possibility of a value or no value. And then result specifies something that can possibly fail. And also if it fails, what is the reason, for example. So these are two very core types. There's a lot of utilities that people have built surrounding these types because they're used literally everywhere. Every code base, you will see them. Okay, so my last, hold on, let me see. Okay, yes, the last topic we'll cover today is traits and polymorphism. So for those of you who have used Java TypeScript, this is something like interface. Or for those of you who have used uh, protocol, in, or those of you who have used Swift, it's something like protocol. So you use it to group common behavior between types. So for example, you can say that both arrays and linked lists are iterators. That means you can iterate over a linked list and you can also iterate over an array. So it's a common behavior that both of these things have. So in Java, you might use a superclass, for example, to define common behavior. In Rust, we don't have notions of classes and inheritance. We simply have traits, which are attributes of something. So we define a trait very simply. Here we are defining a trait walk, which is saying that if you implement this trait, if you have this trait in your, like if a struct has this trait, for example, it can walk, right? And how does it walk? The struct has to tell you. So you have walk and then position, and then it returns the new position after it's walked. So this imaginary 1D character, right? It, it, it walks on uh, integer. integer. Then it walks on the number line, for example. So when you implement a trait, so this is why, um, to answer your question again, this is why Rust has separated the implement blocks from the types themselves. It's because you would implement walk trait for the person. So a person has a speed and you implement walk for the speed and this is how a person walks. A person walks by taking their position and adding their speed. How about an animal? How does an animal walk? Well, an animal walks at a constant speed but it might walk forward or it might walk backwards. So we implement walk for animal, and if the animal is facing forward, we plus five, and if the animal is facing backward, we minus five. So both, uh, both person and animal structs, well, they can walk, but how do they walk? Well, we specify that by implementing the trait for the struct. <laughs> Uh, I don't know. I mean, I think the semantics are the like the meaning will be the same. Um, this is just syntax. Yeah. So I can't. I don't. I don't know. Yeah. But um. So so again, you have struct x. Uh. Question was if is it just is this just syntactic sugar, and the answer is I don't know, but probably not. Um. Yes. Okay. Let's try. Nope. 
So it's mainly just for trades. Yeah, this is not a trade. So this implements just general methods without a trade, and this implements uh, some trade for test. Yeah. So using a trade, how do we use a trade? How do we say that I'm now writing a function that give me something that walks and I'll walk it, right? So this gets a bit more hairy and complex. Well, I will say that perform walk takes in anything T, any type T, any struct that can walk. So this says that can walk. And so now this walker will walk. Not a very good example. <laughs> now that I'm saying it out. It's my first time saying it out, guys. Uh, wow, okay. Let's break, let's break this down. So now we have perform walk, right? Say walk me. Okay. So something that can walk. So a something that can walk will implement the walk trait. That's what this is saying. And now the walker, which is okay, the something, something, which is the something that can walk, is going to walk. <laughs> this is still very complex. <laughs> Okay, yeah, but uh, it can walk. So um, how do we know? Okay, so I guess to let's put everything in one screen. But how do we know that uh something we can do something dot walk? Well, we see that trade walk has a walk function that takes in position and returns position. Well, now we know that um something which is a walk, will have a walk method down here. So we can call something dot walk because it is a walk. It is a walking thing. Walking trait. Because it has walking trait. And this will call whatever it is that is implemented. So for example, we have we have our slow person. And now when we perform walk on that slow person, we pass it position 32, it will return 40, uh, 52. Yeah. Well, if we perform walk on fast person, it will return 32 plus 55. And then animal can also perform walk. So notice how perform walk can take in persons and it can take in animals. And more generally, it can take in anything that implemented our trade walk earlier. Implement walk for something. Implement walk for person, implement walk for animal, makes it so that we can call perform walk on that thing. Yeah. Hopefully that's enough. Um, I can perhaps clarify later, but for the interest of the 10 minutes that we have left. Um, oh. Okay. <laughs> Uh, uh, I'm so sorry, guys. Let me just. Yes, I I was gonna use that. I forgot. Okay. Uh, yeah. There we go. Okay. So, uh, so if you copy paste it in, uh, and you go tools and you click Rust format, uh, it will format it for you in a nice way. Thanks. Oh, you can actually click format. Oh, okay. Yes, you can click format. Everything will look a bit nicer. So I've created sort of a tic-tac-toe game. I've implemented most of the structure uh, and I've added to-dos around the place, all over the place. So using the clues, for example, oh no, what do we do for player, right? Well, we can just look down and see what does a player do? Oh, we see this. What could it possibly be, right? So um, using these clues that I've put around, um, try to write the full program. Uh, I'll just give it maybe six minutes and then I'll just go through it really quickly. So this try, I tried to put together everything that we've covered for today.